Welcome to the Sankofa Pan African series. How did artworks like the Benin um, heads get to various foreign locations where they are presently? My guest today is another ally who has been working to see that African arts are returned to their rightful homes. But before we meet him, please continue to support us by clicking on your subscription and notification buttons if you've not yet done so. Thank you. Dr. Richard Anderson is a lecturer in history at the University of Aberdeen. He has previously taught at the universities of Exeter and Leicester in the United Kingdom and was a postdoctoral um, candidate at York University in Toronto. Richard is a historian of West Africa and the author of um, the book Abolition in Sierra Leone. Hi Richard, welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Thank you very much Richard for being a part of the Sankofa Pan-African series and for all the work you do. I'm really excited to be having um, this conversation with you. Um, I know you're a scholar of West African uh, history. So before we even go into the bronze heads and all of that, um, can you share with us some of what you know about, the, uh, about Benin? Well, I work a lot on pre-colonial West Africa, my particular emphasis on Sierra Leone, um, but really looking at West Africa and especially um, countries that today, such as Nigeria, Sierra Leone, um, uh, and Ghana that were previously British colonies. Um, and of course, how Benin fits into these in different ways. So thinking about Nigeria as a historical construct and the pre-colonial polities that existed there beforehand um, and their interactions with outsiders um, in the case of the Kingdom of Benin over more than 500 years. Uh, and Benin has an interesting story to tell in relation to um, cultural contacts with the Portuguese um, going back to the 1480s um, and how this is at that period um, not an interaction in which Europeans are in an advantageous position. So the extent to which this is a meeting of Africans and Europeans and a particular sort of power relationship that changes over the next few centuries. Mm -hmm. um, and then how you see this reflected within Benin. Um, Benin's interesting insofar as we see the arrival of Portuguese priests and missionaries, um, but the history works out very differently than say the Kingdom of Congo, which in some ways has a similar relationship with Portugal. Um, but then how this, how this relationship is narrated um, and the Benin bronzes fit into this because we're looking at a society as with many pre-colonial West African societies that didn't have the written word. So how do they tell their history and present their history? Um, and so one way, especially in my teaching is we'll look at the Benin bronze and say, well, what does this say about the values of these societies? How does this perhaps narrate what's important about the history of Benin? Okay, you said something uh, I find really interesting when you when you talked about the relationship between, between the Empire of Benin and um, um, the Congo, uh, mm -hmm. both um, interacting with Portuguese. How do, how were they different? They're different in so far as the Kingdom of Congo um, today is actually part of what's Angola, where its capital is based. They are both based upon hereditary kingship. And so when Portuguese arrived, they saw these analogies. Um, but the real difference is when we look at the Kingdom of Congo, we see, especially among the, the elite, a conversion to Christianity. Um, and it's taken in and becomes a sort of localized form in certain ways. And so in some ways, their, their interaction with um, the offer of Christianity is quite different in that regard. Um, and so it's interesting to see because when I teach on the Kingdom of Congo, you see that this is a powerful kingdom going back five centuries, um, 
and they don't necessarily dress or act or interact as students who might not have a background in African history expect a kingdom to speak and interact. So if you look at their interactions with the kings of Portugal, their written correspondence, their regalia, their iconography. Um, and so in some ways there's interesting comparisons and in, in contrasts um, between the kingdom of Benin and the kingdom of the Congo. But you also realize that they're not particularly different in several key ways to European kings and kingdoms during the same period. So uh, uh, my sense is that in a way, the Benin, the Edo, you know, um, reserved a lot of their traditional values and beliefs. Um, mm -hmm. And they were more, they were more reluctant to embrace uh, the Catholic religion, which was what mm -hmm. is brought to the Congo, as well as um, um, to Benin. Mm -hmm. That one of the differences were yeah, and also I think it gets at things related to the logic of conversion, right? If we're looking at a history over 500 years, especially in relation to um, Christianity. Now, in the case of the Congo, it's, again, a, a region that is early Portuguese influence and then, uh, you know, becomes a Portuguese colony. So the association with Catholicism is strong. With the history of Benin and Nigeria, of course, you have the Portuguese arrivals and then you have a rather slow arrival of the British and then the sort of incorporation, particularly of Protestant missionaries, uh, in some ways, African converts, some of whom come from Sierra Leone, which I study. The Patriots from Sierra Leone. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And there are also a lot of misconceptions about um, the Benin Kingdom mm -hmm. um, out there. Can you share some of them? We don't yeah, this is an, uh, an era when I look like, particularly when we're looking at the later Victorian period, um, where we see a rise of scientific racism. This is when you get a lot of the first published reports. This sort of comes on the back of, you know, the era so, of so-called exploration, um, but it's infused with a particular type of scientific thinking. Um, you know, if we look at the Kingdom of Benin, and actually many parts of West Africa, a lot of stereotypes come from the explorer Richard Burton. Now he's more associated with explorations in East Africa, looking at the Great Lakes, the origins of various rivers and so forth. Um, later on, he takes uh, a position as a British consul uh, on, what, on Fernando Po, so part of what's now Equatorial Guinea. Um, and it's an era when steamships make this passage somewhat faster. So he writes this volume called Wanderings in West Africa. And he takes a steamship down the coast um, and it has chapters like three days in Sierra Leone or 18 hours in the Gambia. And despite the fact that he often spends very little time in these locations, he has the confidence of a Victorian explorer where he can make sweeping generalizations about the people. And so a lot of what we see um, in his work in 1863 is a depiction of, um, of, of the kingdom of Benin, of the Edo people. Um, that's really steeped in a lot of stereotyping, but has had an incredible endurance. So relating to slave trading um, and human sacrifice. And again, these become sort of substantiating tropes for the capture of a lot of territory during this period. Um, so the continuation of the slave trade um, in say the capture of Lagos, which is first bombarded in 1851, annexed a decade later, um, you know, what, what is the narrative that's used to justify these military incursions? And that's one. There's similarities to um, the stereotyping of, say, the kingdom of Dahomey to the West um, and what is today the Republic of Benin. Um, so essentially, it's very often that um, these are stereotypes that emerge, especially among polities that aren't necessarily amenable to, to um, British um, sort of foreign policy on the ground in these regions. So now to the this interesting aspect of the the, uh, the name bronze heads. Mm -hmm. um, how did those the the artworks like the Benin bronzes and other African artworks how did they get from their various home places to foreign locations mm 
like mm -hmm. uh, the Aberdeen University and other museums? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's very clear, it's not exclusively the case, but most objects that relate to um, what we now refer to collectively as the Benin Bronzes were taken in 1897. Um, in uh, an invasion and sacking of Benin City, the capital of the kingdom. Um, this is normally uh, what's euphemistically called the punitive expedition of 1897. It's one of many punitive expeditions the British mounted, particularly in this era, in, in the years after the scramble for Africa in the 1880s. Um, and so it is a capture particularly of the Obus Palace and an eluding of these objects. And so many of these were, and again, there's analogies to European kingdoms at this period. These were objects that were related to the court. They had different functions related to um, functions of the monarchy. Um, some are religious in nature. Um, and a lot of them were ways of telling the story of, of, of the kingdom and its, and its rulers. Um, pictorially with, within the palace. Um, and so these items were taken. This was a force that was British and African auxiliaries, but um, at least 2000 items were taken from, from the palace, um, which was then, it is said, accidentally burned. Um, and so um, I think we have to understand this is sort of a, it was a conscious act in two respects, not just of the collection of loot uh, and objects that really struck European observers, so much so that when they were first displayed in London, there was among some a disbelief that Africans could make these. So there is that stealing of objects that they saw and were items that appealed to them, um, but it's very much also a conscious act of the erosion of sovereignty. It's the equivalent of stealing the crown jewels mm -hmm. uh, in a way. You're taking away items that are of, of, of ritual significance, um, and of significance in relation to symbols of political power. So the diffusion of objects from the 1897 punitive expedition um, was both through um, British forces, so official channels, and that is that they returned to Britain officially. Um, in part, that's part of the reason why um, the British Museum has the largest collection of any repository in the world, um, where over 700 items arrived after the raid um, and why the British Museum has over 900 um, Benin bronzes today. But it also meant that a lot of individual soldiers who participated I took this back. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go on. So in some ways, these are items that were sold immediately after. Uh, and you see interesting interactions with um, particular auctioneers and traders. And some people complain and they say, these items are quite expensive. And the response will be, I'm, I'm certain these will be much more expensive still soon. Um, and of course, we've seen one that was auctioned not that many years ago for, for 10 million pounds. So in that respect, they were correct. Um, but there were also many that remained in private hands. Um, that is that they kept them within the family. This is something that was sort of a, a prize of an expedition abroad and were passed down through the families. Colonial soldiers, sent by the British government to go and loot on behalf <laughs> of the British government, who now decided to enrich themselves. They were stealing from their government. Yeah, I don't know some of the specifics of the actual divvying up of, of, the, uh, of, of, of the loot, as it were, but there are, you know, there are many photos taken in the immediate aftermath where these items are laid out on the ground uh, in front of soldiers who are often named. Um, and so in some cases we can trace um, where these objects are. Um, and it was actually within the past 10 years that the grandson of, of one of the individuals who was involved in the raid um, reached out and, and returned two items that had passed down through the family. Um, but that's an exceptional case. Um, and very often we don't actually know sort of the, the global diaspora of these objects because we don't necessarily know whose hands they're in especially those that didn't make them their way to museum collections after 1897. But so that speaks to um, the next question I was going to ask, which has to do with um, why has it been so difficult, you know, for those items to be returned? So apparently we don't know where some of them are um, because some of them are still in private hands, you know, mm -hmm. 
within private families, but those ones that are in the public domain, in, in museums, in universities, why has it been so difficult for them to return them to the rightful owners? Um, for a long time, there was a lot of internal resistance. Um, and again, you know, we have to consider that this is not something new, right? There's a lot of emphasis now in the return of these objects, but we know that actually um, the first claim for repatriation of objects goes back to 1935, when the Oba asked for um, two throne stools, um, which you know had been lifted in 1897, taken back to Britain. Um, the response at the time is that they'd subsequently been sold to Germany into a museum. And so the response then was that, well, these items are now in Nazi Germany. And so the trail sort of trailed off there. Um, and it was a, a formal request in 1977 um, for a particular um, um, ivory carving of the Ioba, that is the, the, the mother of the Oba for um, uh, an arts and cultural festival in Lagos called Festac 77. Um, the British Museum denied that at the time. Um, and so they used uh, at Festac um, um, a sort of recreation, a, a car facsimile uh, by a Nigerian artist. Um, so for a long time, there was that denial of not being open to this. Um, and some people who were in museum studies, some people who are curators, um, there were arguments for this. Um, and some of them are quite self-serving, I think. But there's ideas of um, the life history of an object. So that is to say that, you know, an object um, takes on more of a story via its own history. Uh, and so repatriation is actually removing that because in some ways, you know, it was additive that now it is in a, a, a Western collection that has been studied and so on. I, I'm not quite clear <laughs> what that <laughs> argument. No, I know these are quite, you know, that is, uh, I'm putting forward sort of the strongest, as I understand it, academic argument against this. And oh. the other would be the yeah, notion so, of a... Un I just want to wrap my head around that. Yeah. So the fact that it was taken from its rightful place and then has been yes the British yeah. Museum where it's being studied as far as they're concerned should yeah. at, least stop at the time returned and this would be the stance of if you look at some of the publications um, and claims of say the British Museum 20 years ago the reason why they say it shouldn't be is because being in the music uh, British Museum has now become part of its history yeah, in a sense. Why why it's not they're not being yeah. <laughs> okay. absolutely only, so, academics, only academics will come up with such a <laughs> no. Well, it's it's an amazing inversion, right? Because you're taking colonial violence and you're then claiming that that is a, a creative act. Yeah, um, but that is something that you know it's surprising how much that was debated by certain people within the field of museum studies, the sort of mm -hmm. life history of an object, as it were. Mm. Um, you know, and in some ways that is changing and the barriers are the fact that um, there are very often national laws against the repatriation of objects. Um, that depends on uh, policies in a particular country, very often depends on the government in power. Uh, in the UK, there's been a government in power for a decade who are very much against this idea of a repatriation uh, to the extent that Recently, uh, in response to these discussions, they've threatened the, to, you know, um, take back the funding of national institutions that might undertake an act of repatriation. Wow. So this applies to certain institutions and not others. So these are national institutions, which in the case of, of Great Britain would be places like the British Museum, um, the Victoria and Albert, for example, um, doesn't apply to universities. Um, even though universities here are public, but they are not a state institution in that sense. Yeah, and so in some ways we have scope where other institutions might not, where even if the aspirations of curators have changed, it's not necessarily that easy for them given um, national law. Okay, because they might face the punishment of having their funding cut down. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I I do know that your your university Aberdeen University uh, recently announced their willingness to return 
you know, one of the uh, Benin uh, heads that was in your university's custody and you were a part of, uh, of, of that group. So can you, you know, tell us um, what has been the process um, of getting us to where we are today, where your university has agreed to return? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I'll, I'll just preface that by saying that uh, I joined the university uh, last year. Uh, and so I joined uh, a conversation that was already long in progress uh, and led particularly by, by Neil Curtis, who's the head of our museums and special collections. Um, and so we knew that we had uh, this particular figure, which was the head of an OBA uh, in our collections. Um, we knew that we had purchased it at auction in 1957 from Sotheby's for 750 pounds. Um, but it was also very clear that its origins lay in the 1897 raid. Um, and considering then the possibility for repatriation. And the university does have um, a record of this, you know, the question of, of returning items of problematic provenance is not new and though a lot of attention is on Benin at the moment, um, that's not always been the sort of the, the the center of attention or necessarily part of, of sort of broader um, discussions. Uh, and so in the case of Aberdeen, we've repatriated, for example, um, uh, First Nations items, particularly to Alberta. And so a lot of the comparative elements with this sort of policy is related to especially ancestral remains of, of indigenous peoples um, in the Americas um, and elsewhere. Um, because we are, many universities of a certain age have what was at the time referred to as the Ethnological Museum. And so Aberdeen's a very old institution. Its origins date back to 1495. Um, and okay. so it's had a museum and had museum collections that have existed for centuries. And of course, um, their creation spans the entire history of the British Empire. So the actual process began with having an internal five-step process looking at claims for restitution of objects, um, and also looking at the basis um, internationally is that um, a claim has to come from a claimant outside the institution. So that is to say that the process has to come in this instance from, from Nigeria. Um, and so in working through this, we had seen sort of the problematic origins of this object and its acquisition. Um, and so uh, the university spoke initially with a professor, Bangkole Sodipo, who's a professor of law at Babcock University. Um, and normally how these processes work is they begin informal communication, then leading to a formal claim. Um, and so working with Professor Sodipo, um, an official claim was made by the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Information and Culture, um, the court of the Oba of Benin, Edo State Government and the National Commission for Museums and Monuments. Okay, um, so if Professor Shodipo, um, who is not in any way, I, I, I mean, not, I, I don't know if his affiliation with the Benin or the University of Benin, um, the university he actually teaches in is in another state of Nigeria. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. So any Nigerian can actually initiate the process. Is that what it means? And no, then, that's where we started considering, uh, you know, as speaking with a professor of law about, okay. you know, because, of course, we cannot return these to the pre-colonial entity that existed before British colonialism. Yeah. The Obas of Benin um, remain. Yeah, there's a hereditary Obaship. Yes. Um, but yeah. A lot of this is, in some ways, you know, the political power lies with the Edo state government and, and the federal government. And so within Nigeria, we see sort of those three levels um, cooperating, especially in relation to the repatriation of these objects. Um, and that is eventually where the claim came from, um, particularly from the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. And so that began an internal process where we looked through um, a process for repatriation or what we call deaccession that looks at the identity of the item, its history, um, possession and ownership, um, the connection between the claimant, 
its significance for the university and then the consequences of return. Um, so in some ways, the next step was um, researching into the history of, of the object um, and presenting a report based on that. Okay. I know there's a group called the Benin Dialogue Group. Yeah. Are they involved in any way and or what do they actually represent, the Benin Dialogue Group? Mm -hmm. So the Benin Dialogue Group is um, a collection primarily of, of universities, uh, museums rather, some of them university museums um, and, uh, and other sort of cultural heritage centers. Um, and they formed, I believe in 2018 and had a series of meetings, particularly from 2010 on. Um, and they include sort of very large um, museums and, and who hold large collections of Benin bronzes. So places like the British Museum, certain institutions um, in Germany, um, a lot of what they looked at was dealing with um, the barriers in terms of um, national law, especially. Um, and so one thing that the Benin uh, group is focused on, the dialogue group has focused on the idea of a permanent loan. National law means that the full and unconditional return of these objects is impossible, or there's consequences that museums can't face at the moment. So this might seem preposterous from the outside, right? Saying, well, something was taken over a century ago and now it's going to be loaned back. But in some ways it's how you get past some of these um, legal hurdles if, if the end goal is um, a sort of reunion uh, of objects um, within the Nigerian museum. But laws are never written in stone. Um... Pressure groups can be formed to to change, you know, change laws. No, that, and that's absolutely the case. And there's precedence for this, especially related to, say, um, repatriation of objects related to the history of the Holocaust. Yes. Um, and external pressure can play a role. You know, there are examples where um, there was a large collection of objects from what is... Uh, today Peru, um, particularly Inca objects that were held by Yale University. Um, and a lot of that was persistent pressure that came from the Peruvian government to, to an extent where, you know, if this is in the public spotlight, then very often you can find a way. So from your experience <laughs> and then given your background, um, what advice would you have for other people who are interested in having African arts repatriated? I mean, how can they strategize around all these, um, um, all these obstacles, you know? I mean, I think in some ways that, um, you know, the level of dialogue beyond those who are stakeholders, the level of public dialogue is, is very good. Uh, and sort of taking that as a teachable moment to talk about this um, and look at, you know, what the actual 1897 raid meant, um, the acquisition of these objects, you know. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, one of the arguments says it was like, well, if, if um, we return it, then we can't look at it. And the question might be, well, was this something that you valued before, you know? I'm someone who, you know, thinks these items are incredibly beautiful, but, you know, have you looked and seen, if you're in the UK, the chances are you're not particularly far from, you know, there are at least 45 institutions in the UK that hold items that were taken in 1897. You know, there are items in Ontario and, and Dan Hicks book has um, an appendix that catalogs the whereabouts. The Rome, the Rome has some. I've yeah, heard. yeah. And so there are, you know, uh, it's some um, in my uh, my home home city of Toronto uh, and, and in Canada, and um, you know the diffusion of these objects primarily to Western museums um, and in the United States. Um, and so I think that um, you know there is a lot of attention around this, and in some ways the emphasis has shifted insofar as for a very long time um, the focus was on the British Museum. Right, this sort of epitomizes um, the ties between colonialism and objects in Western museums. Mm -hmm. um, and the question now is when we look at Aberdeen, whether it's regional museums who happen to have 
one of these items rather than several hundred. Um, but collectively, if we can sort of shift the narrative and have it where, you know, different universities, different museums that might have one of these objects in their collection, you know, what's what is the willingness to 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 look look at this? And I do think that there was an important step where there was a sort of a critical mass of discussion, um, and there were promises to return, um, but the actual act of doing so um, and having Aberdeen be the first to do so can hopefully be, be a catalyst for um, at least some other institutions who, who can and have, have the will to do so. And it's not just the Benin artworks alone. I mean, no, no. There are artworks from other parts of Africa, various parts of Africa that have been taken, you know, at various times and that can be found, like you said, in museums, universities, or yeah. in the Western world. And I think there's a few things, you know, one is to talk about that history and, you know, uh, the Benin case is quite blatant because of its recentness and the ability to track these objects. It's not always the case, but of course, you know, there are many punitive expeditions. Benin is far from the only kingdom whose capital was burned in this period of the pacification of Africa. So asking where these objects came from, um, at the same time, valuing these objects where the claim is, you know, that these have certain cachet after in Western museums, most of them aren't on display. So only about a hundred of more than 900 are on display at the British Museum. Our particular head of an OBA was not on display due in part because of renovations and limited space within the museum. Um, but, you know, treat this dialogue as to say, oh, these are incredible items and, and they should be valued in that respect. Mm. Um, and also recognize at the same time that, you know, this is not an attack on the museum and it's not, you know, as some commentators claim, a slippery slope where you're going to turn around and, and a museum is entirely empty, right? Um, uh. <laughs> well, be, well, it's because, you know, there are, we have objects in our collection that were, you know, we have recent works by, by Nigerian artists. Um, yeah. And there are also possibilities where, you know, well, perhaps I have a vested Most interest in- Nigerian artists who actually sold, uh, yes. you know, commissioned and paid properly to, to do them. So those, you know, can continue to remain there. And if the argument is, um, if they go back to where they're from, uh, people who are used to studying them and admiring them will not, no longer have access to them. Why not build museums in those places? And then yep. use that to even encourage tourism for people to actually pay money to go there and see them in their rightful homes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, the final point we considered in, in our report, which eventually went to the university court. So, you know, it's with any of these institutions, it is something that goes to a university court or a board of trustees and whether they are amenable to um, what we have suggested and whether that might be something that's different um, at a Scottish university such as Aberdeen compared to say the University of Oxford. Um, but we look particularly at the creation of the proposed new Edo Museum of West African Art. Um, it's a fabulous design by uh, Ajay Associates. So uh, an award-winning and, and knighted Ghanaian British architect, um, which is set to open in 2025 um, and with facilities for the storage of these items that is gonna be opened later this year. Um, and so it is, you know, I take this to be the, the sort of a creative act that, that, that adds to the life history of the object as well. Um, yeah, and I, I think uh, people who are, uh, or groups that are really serious about um, um, having these things repatriated should look more closely at whatever the laws were that allowed the repatriation of um, of things after the Holocaust. And what applied to the Holocaust should apply, you know, to this kind of punitive uh, raids and, um, you know, illegal ways of <laughs> acquiring artworks from mm -hmm. Africa as well. You know, I, yeah, I, I think, they, I think they, they, they probably need to spend a bit more time studying, you know, the arguments that won yeah. uh, the case for the return of Holocaust uh, well.
and and then apply the same. If it's good for the goose, it should be good. <laughs> be, be good for, for for the gander as well. Mm-hmm. How soon can we really expect this uh, particular he- uh, uh, head of the Oba from Benin um, to get to Nigeria from Aberdeen? Uh, I'm told that it is imminent. Um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The movement in you know uh, insurance of the that that's not my specialty so that has been that has been left to uh, the uh, the proper authorities in in this respect um, so I'm being told that 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 is uh, imminent and um, you know unfortunately COVID uh, meant that uh, we weren't able to give it a proper send off it would have been very nice to have an event around its repatriation um, and discussing that. Um, I was never able to do the closure of our museums to see the item in person, but um, I fully intend to uh, travel and see it in 2025. So. Thank you very much, Paul, for being a part of the Sankofa series and for the work you continue to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for watching this episode of the Sankofa Pan African series. Please give us a thumbs up and share this uh, video with your contacts and please please don't forget to share with us on our community page what you have done today to help change the negative narratives about africa africans and the african diaspora see you next time